but like to reconstruct edit by edit seems a, a very difficult uh, task without having Orson Welles there. So, yeah. So to the first part. Um, so I heard about the project kind of in passing uh, nine and a half years ago um, during a dinner at the Cannes Film Festival. Just uh, I, I was made aware that the rights to an unfinished Orson Welles film existed. I had. Um, some prior knowledge to it. it there was a, a brief mention. There's a, a fabulous article that was published in Vanity Fair and then in a collection of Vanity Fair articles that, about the, the, the treasure hunt for the missing reel of Ambersons. And at the very end, there's some mention that there was this movie, this very mythologized movie called The Other Side of the Wind. So I didn't know about its sordid history, and I certainly didn't know what I was going to about to get myself into. But um, that was the entry point, and then I was introduced through a mutual friend to Oya Kodar, um, who is also a very good friend of Jonathan's. Um, so this is kind of the circuitous road that brought us together. Um, and that started me on this journey about figuring out the wrangle of rights, because um, Oya had a, had a controlling share of the rights, but certainly not the only one, and it was uh, a very complicated process. So that took me a, a good seven years to, to first assess and then to acquire. Um, and, uh, and I think that this is really a good point to thank Netflix because um, and I think they deserve you know, a round of applause because they, they saved this movie and there would certainly be no movie without them because once all the rights were aligned, it wasn't like every single studio came calling. Um, you know, you've seen this movie and it's, you know, as, as Claire Denis was a fantastic French filmmaker who um, I just had the you know, kind of pleasure of watching the movie with her in Lyon, France, and she said, this movie punches you in the face, you know, and so, so these type of movies aren't exactly commercial hits. Uh, so, you know, so it's, you know, for us it was a labor of love, but for Netflix it was something where, you know, they were passionate about the film and about its history, and, uh, you know, so when they came in, they were really a savior, because the other thing I had in place, which was kind of, a piecemeal distribution would not have had the type of platform and reach that they do. So I'm um, very grateful. Um, then, in terms of the finishing of it, it was you know equally complicated because there was so much misinformation. We had no idea. You know, by one account, I was told that there was 11 hours that Orson shot, and I had seen about 10 of those, um, and a lot of it was simply oral history. Um, and Orson was such a filmmaker who. You know, by this point in his career, it had there were so many projects that were taken away from him or finished in ways that he didn't want, and Orson always wanted to finish things on his terms, so um, he was very protective over all the information. Um, and that's you know, why a lot of the, the testimony that people talked about, you know, and, and, and Jonathan uh, took issue with that in the, in the documentary, because Orson didn't show people the script, so some people thought a script didn't exist. Um, everything scripted, even that, that kind of zany stuff with, uh, with Bogdanovich and Norman Foster, that Regan-Reagan stuff that feels so loose, all of that scripted. Every single word of it, every take after take, Orson is looking for something that's very specific. Um, so, you know, in the process of, of finishing the film, you want to chime in with something? Well, I think one thing that I could add to my list of things that this film isn't, is it isn't his last film. Um, there was actually quite a lot of other films he made. Oh, some have made and on. abandoned and yeah, worked on. I mean, nothing right. to the extent of this one. But I think what, yeah, what becomes confusing, you know, I think we're still all figuring out to some extent what this film is. And of course, if you don't know what a film is, you don't know how to advertise it. So, uh, or it becomes harder to, to represent it. Or so, so that's why it seems to me most of the people who talk about this film talk about it as a satire about Hollywood. They don't talk about it as a film about Wells feeling sexual anxiety about the passivity of male hippies, for example, which is as much as it is a film about Hollywood. They also don't know how to deal with the fact that this is a film that has a co-author, namely Oya Kodak. Because it's important to point out that not only did she collaborate on the script and act as a kind of art director for much of the film within the film, she also directed three sequences. The three sequences being the scene in the car, the sex scene in the car, the scene in the uh, ladies' bathroom before that, and the final scene on the beach, you know, with the 
the sort of like toppling penis. Uh, so those are the, the, I mean, I think the forced perspective stuff, the very end of it, that was predominantly Orson. I know that she did bits and pieces of the, so just to give you some idea of what we had to process in terms of just the information and the massive amount of footage, because as I alluded to earlier, there was 100 hours, not 11 hours of footage. Um, there was nine hours of bathroom footage. Yeah, that's what kind of amazed me. <laughs> yeah. uh, the nine hours uh, is so, it, you know, Well, and, I mean, the fact that there would be so much makes me wonder, uh, you know, also that there was an awful lot that he edited of that too, right? He did bits and pieces. So he worked on that in the, into the late 70s. And, you know, we were told that there was this very frenetic you know, cut, and, um, and he was working on it with Steve Eccleston, and he has this recollection of, we found no evidence of this. This is the usual process of, you know, of something that's repeated over and over until people think it's fact. Um, and it certainly, we found no evidence. We found bits and pieces of that scene, but we had to do the, the nightclub and the bathroom scene. Bob Morawski, the fabulous editor, um, you know, did a miraculous job giving it that type of shape and things that had been communicated to us and little bits and pieces that we read about what Orson's you know, goal was for those scenes. Because the film within the film is not scripted. Um, it, you know, it has a loose narrative, and, and Oya and Orson worked on it. There was a treatment for it. But uh, had, we not, had we not had those pieces, um, the, the, the little section from the studio um, with the Robert Evans character, and then the the this is what we call second day with the train car, those sequences, and then the, the car sex scene, and then the, the phallus at the end, all, all those things Orson edited. No, well, I think that's important that he, he edited single-handedly, too. He wasn't, or he was not involved with that at all. So he had the last word. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that they collaborated in comparable ways on F for Fake and on this film. Because in both cases, they combined a story by each of them. Uh, and the other side of the wind, the story of Oya was the idea of a director who sleeps with his leading, leading ladies because his leading ladies sleep with his leading men. And Wells' was, Wells' story was originally about bullfighting, but it was about an old uh, aficionado who had a kind of home, you know, let's say, a, an unacknowledged weakness for, you know, or attraction to men. Um, and what's interesting is, I, I think this is another factor that I find fascinating. Both Oya and Wells could be described as reclusive exhibitionists. Uh, I mean, Oya lives in sort of like uh, a very remote part of Croatia. She's not on the internet. You know, it's like uh, she still hasn't seen the final version of this film, in fact. Um, we keep trying to get her to see it. Uh, but, but, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, she had, it's mostly had... been health issues. Uh, but she did see a, a, the, a cut of the film right before we locked picture. And she sent over three notes which were so surgical. She said, do you have that shot of the mill right before he goes yeah. into the rain room? You should add it to the end of that sequence, which was starting to get really long. And so we're like, wow. you know. And then she said, isn't there a line when uh, Mazursky or, or Jaglum says that's Jewish logic, and I'm like, in the eight hours of random <laughs> interviews, that's the one thing that you want? She's like, oh, Orson cracked up over that. It made him laugh so hard. And I said, all right, in, in, it, in it goes. Um, you know, But it was just so specific what she was looking for. And, and this is pre-Michelle Legrand's score. I I understand. In fact, I was lucky to be able to spend uh, a weekend with Oya at her home in July after I saw the film. And we spent the entire weekend talking about the film. I mean, she wanted a very detailed account from me about it. Uh, but also, she told me a lot about what was her conception and what was his conception of the film. I think one thing that's very hard to grasp, which is, but it's very central, is the idea that in the film within the film, she's essentially playing Jay Taniford. That in a sense, because she becomes his sexual surrogate, there was this whole idea that in a certain way, kind of way, and that's why she kind of thought of her character as a kind of like praying mantis. Um, 
she also felt, and this was true when, when, when we spoke about the film years ago, I mean, when I was first, because I've known her for 30 years, when she said that in a way that she thought it was a feminist film, and I think it is a feminist film, but in a very politically incorrect way, partly because all the characters are so unpleasant in certain ways. But that goes for, you know, Wells' body of work. It's always, you know, it's always these deeply flawed characters, and, and, and he's such a nuanced filmmaker where, you know, he obviously do doesn't celebrate, um, you know, the misogyny in the film. Um, and, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's equally offensive to every race and creed. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, I think one of the most puzzling things about the film for me, and it's really, uh, to me, is really interesting, is the fact that the Jake Hannaford that we see at the party and the Jake Hannaford who made this movie don't seem like the same person. And, and the way I interpret this, actually, partly, is, you know, if you go back to Citizen Kane when you say, I don't think one word can explain a man's life, I think Wells saw a human personality as being very mysterious that there were all kinds of things that we didn't understand and didn't know. And you could find parallels in the other films, you know, like when, in, you know, the character of Quinlan in Touch of Evil, when he's talking about his early life, or, or Cotton. There are things that don't seem to fit. And I think it's because Wells was almost like a kind of agnostic when he came to the idea of homogeneous human personality. He thought that there were a lot of things that we didn't understand and were mysterious. And so when people talk about this film, too, as being autobiographical, yes and no, because on the one hand, it's true that even Wells has believed that his father committed suicide, for example, you know, in relation to Hannaford, and that Wells... And the relationship between him and Peter, which obviously, you yes. know, we're talking about kind of how metatextualized this film is, not only to itself, but to the life of Orson's life, so that's where the you know autobiographical aspects come in. But um, yeah, but the, the character is also very much based on Hemingway. Obviously, the date this takes place on July second, the date that Hemingway killed himself. Um, also, John Ford, whom Orson revered, and uh, and he was heartbroken when he found out in the in the early seventies that John Ford couldn't get a job, and he said, "Wow, this is what happens to the filmmakers." He said, "Genius comes out at young age and old age, not in the in a middle years." He said, I can't believe that he can't get a job. So this kind of this idea of Jake Hannaford trying to make a comeback picture is very much, you know, speaks to all these things and all these experiences. And, and also Orson thought that, you know, it's a, Hemingway's machismo was some type of latent homosexuality. Um, because, you know, he, uh, there, well, it's a long story, but Orson had a, a, a relationship with, with Hemingway that started with a lot of antagonism where he really played up the fact that he was this, you know, theater queer, as he called him. Um, and so he loved to get under Hemingway's skin by playing that up. So it's, you know, and so he thought that, you know, deep beneath all that was some type of late homosexuality. So that's the, a lot of the stuff that he put into this script and, uh, and, and into the performance of, of John Huston. So I think it's we, also important to point out that well, as critical as other people have been of Wells, no one was more critical of him than he was himself. And there's an awful lot of self-criticism, it seems to me, in the portrait of Hannaford, as well as, um, but I think he wanted to be challenged, and that's why, in a sense, he invited Oya to have like input in various ways, because it was the idea of also representing the, the point of view of someone who was much younger. Um, and I think, of course, Oya is a kind of person who's a complete outsider of the world of film. I mean, she's a sculptor, and she's work, you know, she's a writer also, but she's not really a film person at all. And so, for example, the idea that this was a, a parody of an Antonioni film doesn't really work out too well because, I mean, if there's little in it that relates to the style of Antonioni, and Oya had barely seen any of his films and wasn't even thinking about it. So that the kind of Freudian references, the thing that could be called pretension and all of this, were her contributions in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're running out of time, uh, I'm Sorry. afraid, and I, but I, I can you just clarify how much of the film is Wells' cut, and how much is it? Is, I, I think, you know, um, I mean, if we really yeah. talk about you know, something that was fine cut or loosely assembled, I think about 30% is Wells, and then 70% is us trying to figure out what the heck Wells was trying to do. Um, and you know, so it's, um, obviously we had you know, a, a long paper trail of things, of, of notes and, and of correspondence. Luckily, 
you know, free labor was young labor for Orson. Um, so a lot of the people are still around who were working with him, a lot of the editors and uh, you know, various other parties. So we actually you know, were able to talk to people and, and, and figure out, Oya included, um, you know, what it is that he wanted and the fashion in which. But you know, he edited bits and pieces from the beginning, middle, and end of the film. So it wasn't like we had 40 minutes and it was the, you know, the first 40 minutes. So that gave us a, a very good roadmap, and then everything was just uh, you know, five linear feet of scripts uh, at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, so we had a, an annotated script. And we, we had a lot to go on. Um, and then you know, at the end of the day, you kind of, once you're in a closed room with a few people, you make the best movie that you can and, and hope it's, um, you know, it, it's effective and it's kind of a, a testament to what Orson ultimately would have wanted. I think it's worth, it's worth adding, by the way, that the Wells' original cut of the sex scene in the car was seven minutes long. And I think hopefully Jonathan that's going to be on the DVD. Us. He'll never forgive us that we shaved off a minute and a half. <laughs> but yeah. I hope yeah, that that'll be on the DVD. Yeah, it, it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but just one more thing that, um, you know, I think obviously Jonathan and I, I mean, this is so much fun doing this with him because, you know, not only kind of one of the foremost Wells scholars, but also a terrific. You know, critic in general and a, a terrific film mind. So this is a lot of fun. We can just sit up here for hours and do this. Um, but something that we've always talked about is, um, you know, because I get asked this question about is this a Wells film? Um, very intimidating question coming from the press and from you know for certain critics. Um, and we've always talked about how freeing this movie was for Wells because he himself probably would have answered and said this is not a Wells movie um, because it's first and foremost a documentary. Um, so he says, you know, I'm not the author of this film, it's a documentary. Um, and then the film within the film is a film by the filmmaker, it's not a movie that I would have made. So talk about, you know, kind of having a freedom being masked twice, and I think that probably enabled him to do something, because he was very puritanical with his approach to sex, doing something like this. And some of the stuff in the bathroom that we didn't make the cut is like, wow, that's pretty racy stuff. Um, so, you know, he had kind of this freedom that allowed him to make this movie by saying, you know, this, this idea of authorship, this is a found footage film which didn't exist in the 70s, which all of a sudden you know, became a thing. But talk about, you know, once again, finding a new language and how innovative he was and that this film still plays. It's so challenging to watch and, you know, we now have you know, 50 more years of film experiences and the film still plays extremely modern, so testament to his genius. And it, it, testament to you guys, thank you so much, Philip yeah. and Rizma. Sorry. Rizma. Yes, and Jonathan Rosenbaum. Final words, very quickly? Yeah, well, I think the, the only comment I just wanted to make is that pseudo-documentary can be traced all the way through his career, from War of the Worlds to the newsreel and Citizen Kane, and when he was making this film, the term mockumentary didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So I think it's... Um, as usual, he was very much ahead of the curve. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so we have uh, another movie starting. Yeah. We have another movie starting, so I, I would ask you to all leave